thing is that so often I get sidetracked. Do you ever get sidetracked? Um, another one, I just say, I'm not wearing a mask at the moment, but um, less than 24 hours ago, Maureen and I had the flow test and we were okay. We we're visiting our friend Margaret Silver, who's uh, in the last stages of dying from cancer and is in the care of Brayborn Care Centre. And uh, so we have to be tested when we go there. The second thing is that um, when I was a student in a seminar in America, I used to see the American spellings, uh, like S-A-V-I-O-R, and I had a little bit of a sense in my youthful folly, or whatever it was, of superiority. We spell saviour, S-A-V-I-O-U-R. And I noticed in that recording that we had there that saviour was spelled S-A-V-I-O-R. And I thought, yes, interesting. <coughs> but a few months ago, my bubble of pride or Britishism or whatever it was, was somewhat burst because I read that actually, if you go back into the older bits of English and that, you look at the history of semantics and whatever the words are, that you know more than I do, I'm sure, it is said that actually their spelling is more accurate and we at some stage have added a U for unknown reasons. What's the truth, I don't know, but what it, the, the truth is for me is that I must not be too pompous in some little element of my being. <laughs> and certainly when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for us, our pride just dissipates, doesn't it? Our pomp is nothing. Our pride melts away and we tremble and worship at his feet. Right. And just one other aside, before I rush through a message. <laughs> well, uh, I hope I won't rush. Corrie Ten Boom was once asked if it was difficult for her to remain humble. Her reply was simple. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, on the back of a donkey, and everyone was waving palm branches, and throwing garments onto the road and singing praises, do you think for, for one moment that it ever entered the head of that donkey that any of that was for him? She continued, if I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honor. And there are similar quotes from other Christians in that vein. But I'm going to come to the main theme now they're gathering together, which is to consider the trip to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. But just to remind us first that we are entering Holy Week. And I, I've got in front of me a paper here with the seven days of the Holy Week, as it were. Up to Friday, this one goes, we know the rest. And it talks about what happened. It mentions the place of Bethany. We had Bethphage mentioned in uh, the reading. Bethany is the house or the place of dates, and Bethphage, P-A-A-G-E, is a place of figs. And I finally found a way of remembering which is which, because figs has a G in it, and Bethphage, P-H-A-G-E, has figs in it. But is that important? It probably is, but it shows uh, the goodness of God in nature, in their provision. It's springtime in the moment and we can see fresh things growing, the corn is growing, ready to ripen in the fields and so forth. And so it goes on through the Holy Week, curtain of the fig tree and uh, Jesus resting in Bethany on Wednesday, Silent Wednesday, preparation of the Passover on Thursday and Gethsemane on Thursday. Gethsemane. Friday, the betrayal, the arrest, and so forth. So, keeping that in mind in Holy Week, then also, as we approach Good Friday, and so it's said in this church building, the seven saints of Jesus on the cross, uh, preparing us for Friday. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Jesus said unto him, the thief, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 
When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciples standing by, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? Which is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. When Jesus then had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And then another thought, just before he died, from Luke's Gospel. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. At the bottom of my sheet, which it has, he is not here, but he is risen. <laughs> so it's lovely thoughts, isn't it? Really lovely thoughts. And um, thinking about our friend Margaret, who is uh, very close to her death. She is a true believer, and she can so readily say, Into your hands I have commended my spirit. May that be true for all of us, because that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus took the triumphal entry journey. That's why he came to. Jerusalem. Right, just a few thoughts then. Our key verses are to do with the saying about Hosanna and blessed. Hosanna and blessed. Verses 9 to 11. I don't know if you can click back to them or not. So Matthew, verses 9 to 11. Then uh, let me see what it says. There we are. The crowds that went ahead of him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then when Jesus got to Jerusalem, the people there asked, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. When it says crowds, as you read the accounts in the four Gospels, at different times the composition of the crowds may be changed a bit, I would say. But it's so fascinating to read it all. So we have then from our account Matthew, who loves to give credit to the truth of the Old Testament, both in the account of the birth of Jesus and now in the account of the triumphal entry, the quote from Zechariah, and so forth. We know from our background, understanding, and being church people and Bible readers, a lot of the story, so I don't need to go into great detail, but we know that Jesus, at a certain point, fixed his, his eyes for Jerusalem, he steadied himself, and he determined to go to Jerusalem. And the events that we consider on Palm Sunday, as you recall, is part of that journey to Jerusalem. In the crowd, as Jesus rode on that donkey, you know how he got the donkey, don't you? It was given, it was led to him. In that journey, the crowd, including the children, were calling out these sayings, which actually come, the, some of them come from what's called the Halal, that's um, some of the Psalms, Psalm 113 to 118 of the Halal Psalms and uh, they're followed by the processional psalms. And so, when Jesus was there, riding towards Jerusalem, and when Jesus was uh, being hailed by the crowds, these words were being called out. But re we recall, first of all, that as he traveled along, the crowd cast palm fronds down in front of the donkey, and they cast even their cloaks down. And one commentator says, the cloaks <coughs> might have been very useful after the donkey had trampled them underfoot. I don't know. But it was a sign of homage, of recognition of Jesus as the son of David. And so the disciples in the crowd and those who were with them, maybe caught up the cry, 
And certainly the disciples in the crowd, many of them cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. Now I was looking at these, and Hosanna, as you will recall, it means save, save now. It's a plea for help. Hosanna. But in its use over the years, and in its use in the Psalms, we see that it's not only the prayer, help me, save now, which they wanted Jesus to do, save them from Jerusalem. The, save Jerusalem from the Romans, save Israel from the domination of a foreign empire, but, um, but also in using the term Hosanna, it became something like Jesus as a saviour. And Jesus as a saviour, we say he's our saviour because we've cried to him to save us. But then also we just credit him with the salvation, redemption, grace which he offers and we say, Jesus is our saviour. We don't ask him again for salvation, but we say saviour. And so the Hosanna was partly to do with um, saying, save us now, in the circumstances of Jesus coming along, will he get rid of the Romans or not, and so forth. The crowd didn't understand. It's partly in the sense of echoing the scriptures and the praise that the true and living only God had in Psalm 118 and other places in Old Testament Holy Writ. And so it goes on. Hosanna to the son of David. So taking those three terms, Hosanna to the son of David. What does that mean to us now? What did it mean to them in those days when the event happened? I personally am not a Jew. I can't claim any ethnic, um, whatever, rights or connections or whatever to the son of David in that sense. Hosanna to the son of David. Well, of course, to the Jews, the Israelites at that time, it meant he is the person who's descended from the great King David who was anointed by Samuel those many hundreds of years ago. And now Jesus, the son of David, was moving towards his rightful position as being in Jerusalem, in the place where kings were crowned and where God was worshipped. Jesus, the Saviour, Hosanna, the place where people are crowned, kings are crowned, and where the Lord was worshipped in the temple. Hosanna to the son of David. But then we remember, we go across to the epistles, don't we? We, we go across to some of the accounts even of what Jesus said about Greeks seeking Jesus. And we come to the matter of adoption. And we know that in Christ, we are grafted into the vine. And if the Jews, the believing Jews, are the natural vine, because Jesus is the son of David and Jesus is the vine, then we are grafted in as Gentiles, and so we belong to the vine. And that term, spiritual nourishment, that comes up to those who are Jews, Israelites, ethnically, and believers in Christ, also that natural nourishment comes into the branches that are grafted on. My granddad, he used to grow different sorts of apples. He'd have one stem, and then he'd cut a, a, a notch into the stem, and he'd stick a twig in, he'd stick another twig in there, and as children would go around, we'd see this one tree, Espalia, against a fence, uh, with three different sorts of fruit on it. One tree, three fruits. And it's a bit like that with us. We are grafted into the benefits of what the Son of David could bring, because Jesus is the vine, and Jesus said, for God so loved the world, not just the Israelites, he does love the Israelites, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's good, isn't it? Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, the um, writer of the New Testament was recording what was said, and what was said was demonstrating the authenticity and the authority and the right of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was son of David, to come in the name of the Lord, the Deliverer, 
the Divine One sent to be our Redeemer. It's good, isn't it? And then it says, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Hosanna in the sense of save me, save us now. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It was, as it were, a prayer asking God in highest heaven, please will you bless these proceedings. Jesus, son of David, is going towards Jerusalem. And the crowd was excited. Their expectations were political. And they were crying out, Hosanna in the highest heaven. May your will, may your blessing be upon what Jesus is about to do. <laughs> well, God's the Father's blessing and will was with Jesus, his son, and what he's about to do. But the crowds, the vast majority of them, and sadly, too many of the disciples themselves, they didn't realise what Jesus was going to do. <laughs> Something far greater than political freedom from Rome, important though that was to the Israelites, Something far greater, it was freedom from the penalty and the power of sin. It was the freedom to enter glory, to inherit eternal life, to have fellowship and communion with Jesus, to worship the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So much to it. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Yes, the blessing of God was there. And if we believe that the blessing of God was there as Jesus prepared on his journey and as he fulfilled scriptures as the son of David and as the coming suffering Messiah, if we believe that happened then, and if we believe that Jesus rose again from the dead, and if we have given our hearts to the Lord Jesus, what does this mean to us now? Are there hosannas echoing out from our hearts and souls? May your will be done. You are the one who can save, you are the one who can help, glorious God. Are we so grateful that Jesus Christ is indeed King? Not only King of Israel, but he will come to the world again and he will reign as King over the earth. He will conquer the earth, what prophecy says. Let's come down a bit. All this excitement, all this expectation, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king that comes in the name. I compare the scriptures to the four gospels and so forth. Not time to go through them all now. But then I come into the Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred, yes. Great excitement. And a lot of people there thought, what's all this noise about? All this shouting, all this excitement. And who is this? And some in the crowd answered the others, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And that comes in Luke's Gospel. And I thought, yes, it is Jesus. He is a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. <laughs> and then I thought of that lovely hymn that we sing. Jesus, my shepherd, saviour, friend, my prophet, priest and king, my lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Who is this? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Far more than that. Far more than that. Who is this? This is the son of David. This is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the one who comes in to fulfill the prophecies in Isaiah 53 and in Psalm 22 of suffering, the suffering and redemptive Messiah in his first coming. Who is this? Not only the son of David, but son of God and son of man, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Who is this? This is the one who was going to conquer death. We're going to be crucified and suffer for our sins. This is one who is the only sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can be made for the sins of mankind. Only the spotless, flawless Lamb of God could take away the sin of the world. What does that mean to us now? And what did it mean in a few months' time, some of those in the crowd who thought maybe Jesus is only a prophet? 
I'm sure that many of those learnt soon afterwards in the early church that Jesus was indeed a saviour, shepherd and friend, a prophet, priest and king. He became their Lord, their life, their way and their end. And they could bring praise to him as we sing about in that beautiful hymn. So we have then the sayings in Matthew 21, 9 to 11, the parallel and similar sayings in the other three Gospels. And they all point us towards one who is greater and higher than us. One more thing, and uh, it's uh, another statement that came during the journey. In one of the Gospels, we see that the Pharisees were very upset. If we use the local term, we say very miffed. Their, their dignity was affronted. Their theology was challenged. Their position was threatened. Their pride was in danger of being burst and hurt. And the Pharisees, when they heard the children <coughs> calling out, Hosanna to the son of David, they said to Jesus, Rebuke the children, tell them off. <clears throat> what did Jesus say to that? Because there are so many other words, aren't there? From the, have you not heard, said Jesus to the Pharisees, who were feeling very discombobulated, have you not heard, from the mouths of children, thou hast ordained praise? And Jesus then said, and this is an amazing statement, I tell you, if the children keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As an aside, we come towards the end. Um, when I was young, there was a film out to do with the stones cry out. It was to do with archaeology and the truth of the Bible. And indeed, the stones do cry out. But not in the sense that children were, of course. Here were living children who were giving praise to the one person who is worthy of it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Those puffed up Pharisees, bless them, there are a few good ones, but the puffed up ones, they were not worthy of praise. They may have strutted around and looked important while the widow put her might in, in that example Jesus gave, but they were not important. The Sadducees and the religious leaders and the scribes and the lawyers, eminent in their fields, maybe, but not important when you look at Christ. Because when you look at the glory and greatness of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of David, Messiah, suffering Messiah, victorious Christ, Redeemer, out of the billions of people who have been born on earth, and the millions and hundreds of millions at that time, the few pompous Pharisees, the few very strict and set in their ways, lawyers and scribes, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection of anyone. What did it matter? Here's the one who created the worlds. Here's the one who made sure we made in the image of God. Here's the one who saw the fall of Adam and Eve. Here was the one who was bringing redemption. Do these people matter? And today, as we go around and we see the mockery, we see what's being taught to children in school, we even see some church leaders saying things which are not in keeping with Scripture. Let's remember, Jesus remains greater and higher and bigger and stronger than all of this. He is our rock. He's our foundation. He's our strength. He's your rock. He's your foundation. He's your strength. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable, indescribable gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have enough here for an hour and a half sermon, but I think I'm going to leave it by saying, Jesus, he succeeded in his journey, he succeeded in his mission, and he succeeds now. And all those who cry out to him, 
he receives in life, redeems them, and they inherit eternal life. What more, what better thing could we ask for than that? Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May God bless us all.